Okay, good afternoon. Uh, so we will continue with uh, synchronization solutions that are available. So we were looking to the hardware solutions. So basically the solutions that are requiring some support from the hardware and that support has been in terms of some machine instructions. So actually we had seen one such instruction in the last lecture which was test and set, right? So we had seen how we can utilize this hardware instruction to provide a solution so that at the end we can implement the entry section of the program using that machine instruction and then enter the critical section and then implement the exit section again using that machine instruction in this way. So we will see today a different instruction which is called swap. Okay. So basically this is a machine instruction that is providing this. If a process executes that machine instruction, this is what happen, what's happening. Two memory variables are operands to that instruction swap instruction, two memory operands, A and B, let's say. So if we execute that instruction on those memory operands, then what will happen as a result? The values of those two memory operands, memory variables, will be just swapped, okay, exchanged. So this is what this instruction is doing, taking two memory variables as arguments or operands, and then it is just exchanging the values, okay? So this actually, uh, this is of course a machine instruction, assembly instruction. So for example, in, in uh, Intel 88 architecture, we have a corresponding instruction called exchange, okay? This is just exchanging the values of two memory variables. So this is what this machine instruction is doing. So of course, if we want to utilize that instruction, we have to program or entry section and exit section in assembly. We need to program in assembly to use that machine instruction Hence, each entry section and exit section code should be programmed in assembly, all right? Remember, we have an entry section and exit section. We use the entry section before the critical section and then exit section after the critical section, okay? So the job of the entry section was this. It is allowing only one process to execute the critical section code. No two processes can be executing the critical section code. And this is achieved by the entry section code, okay? All the processes that have a critical region, they have an entry section code inserted before the critical region so that they have to run that code first. And that code prevents other processes to pass into the uh, critical region if a process is executing the critical region code. So this is the definition of the swap instruction using C language. Okay. So basically it is just exchanging the values of these two memory variables, A and B. Okay, and this is done atomically. Okay, when a machine, a CPU, is executing this instruction, that instruction execution is not interrupted until it is finished. Then it can be interrupted. Okay, a process executing that machine instruction cannot be interrupted until that instruction is finished. Before the next instruction execution, of course, that process can be interrupted, another process can start running. Okay the current running process can be suspended. But this instruction is atomic, all right? Indivisible. So when it is started, it is finished completely before we have a suspension of the current running process, okay? So that means the two values of the memory operands has been exchanged. Normally, how we can achieve that? Normally, we can achieve that by using several machine instructions. If we don't have these machine instructions, we can move the value of one memory operand to one register, move the value of the other one to another register, do the swap, and then move them back to the memory variables, okay? So we need to use several machine instructions to implement such a swap operation if we do not have such a machine instruction. Then those instructions, when they are used, they become divisible, okay? In the middle of executing such a swap, then a process can be suspended and we cannot have atomicity. So by just having a single instruction performing this swap, we can utilize the atomicity of that instruction, okay, to provide a solution. So this is how we provide the solution. So a process that has a critical region then should execute such a code before the critical region and then such a code after the critical region. So we will look what is done here, okay? This is the entry section, okay? So what we are doing here, all the processes that have critical sections are utilizing this piece of code, okay, to protect the critical section. So what do we have here? We have a key, okay, this is a local variable, 
local to the program itself, to, pro to the process, okay? So the other processes cannot share this key variable, okay? It can be a global variable inside the process, but other processes cannot access it, okay? Therefore, I, we say that it's a local variable, okay? And we have a lock variable, initialized to false initially, but this is a shared variable. Several processes, several processes can share this lock variable, okay? So it's a Boolean variable. It can be set either to false or true, okay? It can have zero or one as value. And we have a key value in each process, okay? So it's local to the process. So several processes that are sharing the lock variable can utilize this solution, or we can have several threads, okay, that share a lock global variable, okay, can utilize this solution. Then the key, for example, should be a local variable in each thread, okay? So what is done here in the entry section? We set the key to true, okay, that means we are going to enter the critical section, and then what we do? We compare key against true. While key is equal to true, we swap key with lock. As long as key is true, then we do the check again. As long as key is true, we are just looping around here, okay? So assume initially there is no process in the critical region. Initially the lock value is false. Lock is equal to false indicates that there is no process in the critical region lock is not acquired by anybody. So then the first process that executes this will find what? It will set the key true, it will compare key with true, it will see it is true, okay, so this condition will be satisfied, so it will execute the swap instruction atomically, so that means it will exchange key with lock. So key will be exchanged with lock, so what will happen? Lock value was zero. As a result of this, key will be what? One, right? True. Key will be, sorry, sorry, zero key will be zero as a result of this operation. It will be false. So then, in the next check of this condition, while loop will break. This condition will be false, and that process will be able to enter the critical region. All right? If there is another process, for example, that would like to enter the critical region, while one process is inside, during this time, the lock value is what? One, right? It was zero, but as a result of this swap, key became zero, lock became one, because key is set to one. Okay? So before swap, lock was zero. After swap, lock became one. Before swap, key was true. After swap, key became zero, right? If lock was zero. So after the swap, lock is one, and this process entered the critical section. That means now one process has acquired the lock, and it is executing in the critical section. If another process would like to enter the critical section, it will execute this sequence of code. So it will set the key true. As long as the key is true, it will perform the swap. So key is exchanged with lock. Lock has value 1. So key will have value 1 after this swap. So it will again, the condition will still be true. So we will just loop around. Another process that will enter, the, that would like to enter the critical section will not be able to pass that point. So it will just busy loop, busy wait, okay? What happens, for example, after that process that was in the critical section leaves the critical section, then it will execute this statement here, which is setting lock to false. Okay, then the previous process that was looping around will, after doing a swap, will have key to be, be as zero or false. Then it will be able to enter the critical region because this condition will not be false. Okay, is it clear? So what happens, for example, if two processes now at the same time would like to enter the critical region? All right, so what happens? They will be around here in their executions. So they will set the key to true. Each process will set its key to true, so they will have this condition true, and then they will perform the swap operation. Since the swap is an atomic operation, it cannot be executed in this manner. Either this process or that process will execute the swap earlier, okay? So this is the swap of one process, this is the swap of the other process. So one process will execute the swap earlier than that, the other process, right? In an atomic manner. So the process that has executed the swap first will exchange the key, its key with the lock, its key was 1, lock was 0, so as a, result, as a result of this, lock will be 1, key will become 0, that process will find now the condition as false, so it will decide to go on, right? The other process, after the execution of the slab of this process, can execute the slab. Now when it executes the slab, the other process will now exchange lock value 1 with its key which is also 1, right? because the previous process has set the lock to one. So now the other process will now find the key to be true or false. 
0 or 1? 1, right? So it will perform this swap. As a result of this, keys will still be 1 because lock is set to 1 by the other process. So the other process is now will find that condition true and it will continue looping around here. It will checking the value of the key, continue checking the value of the key. It will perform the swap operation. So only one process therefore will be allowed to enter the critical section. Is it okay? Did you understand? So that means this solution provides mutual exclusion. Okay? It allows only one process to be in the critical region. So that other process will be looping around as long as this process is in the critical region. And if this process leaves the critical region, it will set the lock to false. In this way, the other process will get a chance to execute the swap instruction and have key to become false. In this way, this will be false and the other process may have a chance to enter the critical section. Okay? Is it clear? Any questions? Okay. So this swap instruction or test and set instruction can be used to provide mutual exclusion in the manner that we have shown to you, okay? So in this way, the first property from a solution of a solution uh, for, a, for the critical section problem is satisfied. Remember, there were three properties that a solution should satisfy in order to be a good solution to the critical section problem. First property was mutual exclusion. Second property was progress and the third property was bounded weighting. The first solution, the first property is satisfied, but the second, the third property is not satisfied actually. So this is something that has to be solved. So why not satisfied? What is the third property? It is bounded, bounded weighting property. So if a process X, for example, is weighting, we can have another process Y going into the critical region repeatedly. We should not have this for bounded weighting. If X would like to enter the critical region, if there is another process Y that is in the critical region, and then it will leave the critical region, and then it will go to the critical region, and so on. So if the other process can repeat this several times, and we don't know how many times, if this is the case, that means we don't have the bounded weighting property for the weighting process X. It doesn't know how long it will wait other process, how many iterations. A solution that provides bounded weighting will guarantee that this process waiting, the process X, will be waiting the other process for a number of times, which is fixed, okay, maybe at least once, okay. Then it will have a chance to enter the critical region. But let's look to the solution here, whether it can support bounded weighting. So here assume we have a process in a critical region, okay, that process is executing in the critical region, and I would like to enter the critical region, and I am looping around here, okay, I am a process, I am looping around here. The other process in the, is in the critical region. So, if I am executing in the CPU, we have a single CPU, if kernel decides to run me, then I will be executing around here, right? Just busy looping. Whenever I get the chance of using the CPU, I am just looping in the CPU, okay, and just executing around here. But later on, the scheduler can suspend me and run the other process. The other process may be executing uh, around here, right? It may be executing the critical section code when it is executing in the CPU. So it may execute in this assume the CPU is now the other processes, okay? So the other process is executing in the CPU, so it's executing the critical section code, and then it may leave the critical section code, has finished the critical section code execution. It may execute this statement, which is setting the lock to false, but it may continue running in the CPU, assume its time quantum did not expire yet, okay? So it may execute now the remainder section code, I am still in the ready queue, okay? That process is executing. So that is executing the remainder section code, assume this is short code, small piece of code, it may come back to here, that process, assume, okay? So it's in a while loop, it may execute this piece of code. What is that? It is setting the key true, comparing key with true, that's true, right? This condition will be true. And then swapping lock with key. What's the value of the lock at this point? False. Swapping with key. So key will become false. So this condition will become false while it will be broken. So that process will be entered the critical section again. So I am still in the ready queue. The kernel did not schedule me yet. That process was already in the CPU. So it has entered this critical section, came back, entered the critical section again. Okay? Later on, for example, when it is in the critical section, 
the kernel may schedule me. And I may be now looping around, continue looping around, and I may expire my time slice, and the kernel may decide to run that process again in the critical region, and the same thing may happen. And I don't know how many times it will happen, okay? So therefore, this solution does not provide the bounded waiting. Is it clear? The process that is waiting here is not guaranteed to enter the critical section, for example, after one iteration or two iterations of this process. We don't know how many that process will iterate through the critical section before I can have a chance to go there. So therefore, this is a solution that is not guaranteeing the bounded waiting pro uh, property. But it can be modified to support bounded waiting. So again, this is a modified code. Again, it is using the machine language instruction swap or test and set log. Okay, here in this case, it is using test and set machine instruction uh, for the solution. But it is using now in a different way. And now it supports both mutual exclusion property and bounded waiting property. Okay, so let's remember the solution with the test and set machine instruction. This was the solution. Okay, a process that is a critical section was first doing this before going to the critical section. It is actually checking the lock value using the test and set machine instruction. As long as the lock value is 1, this will return 1, because test and set was doing this. It was looking to value of the lock, okay, and then setting the value of the lock. And this too is done atomically, okay? So I look to the value of the lock, and let's say it is 1, and then set it to 1, and I loop around. If the lock value is 0, however, at the time that I do this, that the, the, there is nobody in the critical section, then I look to the value of the lock, which is 0, so this test and, sec, this test and set will return the value of the previous value of the lock, which is 0, and then at the same time it will set the value to 1. So I decide, I will see, okay, it was 0, I will decide to break the while loop, but at the same time I set it to 1. So when I am here, or when I decide to go to here, the lock value is already 1, and I decide to go and enter the critical section. Okay, another process that does the same thing here, that would like to enter the critical region, we'll see the lock value now, 1, it will also set it to 1, but it will also see it to be 1, and it will loop around here, okay? As long as the lock is 1, it will loop around, and will not be able to enter the critical section. So this was the solution that was using test and set machine instruction, okay? So now let's see, this has the same problem. It doesn't guarantee bounded waiting, it guarantees mutual exclusion so that this critical section code is only executed by one process at a time, but it does not guarantee the bounded waiting property. So how can we modify that to guarantee bounded waiting? And this is the solution, okay? So a process that has a critical section, there may be several processes, let's say there are n processes that would like to use a global variable like a file concurrently in their critical sections. Then each process before the critical section has such a piece of code executed. And after the critical section, such a piece of code executed. And then they can execute in their remainder section. So this can be executed in a while loop in a process, okay? So we have n processes that are running concurrently and executing such a piece of code, okay? So each has a critical section. So what's happening here now? A process that would like to enter the critical section now execute this entry section code. So what is that doing? Each process now, we have n processes for 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, n minus 1. So each process, a process i, for example, is executing this, okay? So we are focusing on the execution of process i. So what is doing the process i? What is process i doing? So it is setting, we have a waiting array, one entry per process, flag array, okay? It's setting its entry to false, okay? So waiting i is set to false. Okay, that means the process is not waiting at the moment yet. So that will be true as long as the process will be waiting, busy looping, okay? So it's just around here. It would like to enter the critical section and it executes this statement and then, as a result, it indicates that it will... So waiting of that is set to true, sorry, okay? The waiting of that process is set to true, so it considers that it will wait. But it may or may not wait, depending whether there is somebody else in the critical section or not. If there is somebody else, it will wait. But if there is nobody else, then it will finally set the waiting to false and it will enter the critical section. So if waiting is true for a process, and if that process is, would like to enter the critical section, that means it is waiting actually to enter the critical section, okay? So it has set waiting to true, process i, and it also says it has a key value, 
variable, local variable, it sets key to true. Okay. So now it is doing this. While waiting is true, waiting i is true and key is true, then it performs execute the test and set instruction and the return value is inserted or put into key variable. Okay. And test test and set is executed on the lock variable. There is a shared lock variable shared among all the processes. Okay, initially it's set to false, but whenever a process enters the critical region, it sets it to true. And as long as a process in the critical region, the lock value is true. Okay. So now what's doing? So if the process is waiting, okay, and the key is true, then it's performing this instruction. So it is basically testing and setting the lock variable. So if the lock is zero, lock was zero. If the lock was zero, as a result of that, key will be zero and lock will be one, right? So you will just return zero into key and set lock to one, okay? So if this process executes this statement, as a result, assume before that lock was zero, as a result, lock will become one and the process will have zero in its key, right? So now it will again go and check the condition. So now this part of the condition will be false, so therefore while loop will be broken. It will break out of the while loop and will come to here. Okay. That means here it has seen the lock to be zero. Okay, and it will break the while loop and will come to here. So it will set its waiting flag to false, meaning that it is no longer waiting to enter the critical region. It will be able to continue and execute the critical section code. Okay? Let's move to another process that's around here in its execution. So uh, while this process is in the critical section, a process J, for example, it can set its waiting to true, key to true, and now this will be initially true, this condition. It will execute this. It will loop to the value of the lock. What is the value? True, right? So process J will see the value of the lock to true, so key will be true. And as a result, lock will be set to true again. No harm with that, right? So now it will loop around again. It will check that condition again, the condition is still true, right? So then what will happen? Again, that other process, the other process will just loop around here as long as the lock is true, which will be the case as long as the first process was, is in the critical region, okay? So therefore, this solution enables only one process to be in the critical section. But let's look what happens when the process has finished its execution. Assume process I has finished its execution of the critical section. So it's around here in its execution, let's say, okay? Process I is around here in its execution, and there is some other processes. There are some other processes, at least one process, waiting to enter the critical section. That means that other process is actually looping around here. Assume this is the case. So then what will happen? The process I is around here, so it will continue executing from here. So what is it doing? It is now looking to an index variable j, to a process j. So j is equal to i plus 1 mod n. There are n processes. That means you are looking to the next process after you. So while j is not equal to i and waiting j is false, okay, then just increment j by 1. Okay, this is a modular increment, mod n. So that means you are actually, the process i is looking to other processes and trying to find a process for which the waiting flag is true. If this is the case, then it will break out of the while loop. If it cannot find another process that is waiting, then the j will be incremented, increment, increment, and then finally it will become i again, okay? It's a circular increment, right? So finally, j will become i again, and then this process will break out of the while loop, and it will come to here. If we are here now, if j is equal to i, what does it imply? That means this process i could not find another process that is waiting. All right? Looping around here, that means there is nobody that would like to enter the critical section. So then what you should do? You were in the critical section, process i. You have, fi you have finished with that. What you should do with the lock variable? You should set it to false, right? So if you could not find another process that is in the critical region, then you just set lock false, and what you do? You go and execute your remainder section code. You do not execute this part of the else statement, if statement, right? 
However, if this is not the case, assume I am process I and I could find another process, maybe there are several processes, or at least one process, a process J, okay, that is actually waiting. That means its waiting slot is true. Then J will not be equal to I in this case. So I will execute this part. So what is that? So this part says that I set the waiting flag of that other process J to false. It was true. It was looping around here. And I set it to false. Then what would happen here? So this would become false for that other process J. So it was looping around. Since this is false now, that other process J will be able to break out of the while loop and execute this statement and execute the critical section. Okay? In this way, I select a process that is waiting and allowing that process to enter the critical section. Okay? So even, for example, I would like to enter the critical section again. So whenever I do that, just at that moment, the kernel may not give this, the CPU to the other process J. Okay? I may continue running. After I set this, I am the process I, and I set the flag of the other process J to false here, but that doesn't mean that that process will be immediately run. So I may continue running, and let's say I have a short remainder section. I came to here and would like to enter the critical section again. Let's say whether I can do that. So I set my waiting to true, key to true, and as long as my waiting is true and key is true, then what do I do? I exchange key and test and set, okay? I execute test and set. That means I look to the value of the lock and assign it to key. What is the value of the lock at that time? It is true because I did not set it to false. So now that means I have to loop around here. So key will be true, key is true, my waiting is true, so now I am waiting here, busy waiting, okay? Sooner or later, the kernel will suspend me and run the other process J that was looping around. It will continue from here, and now it will check the condition again, and it will see that its waiting is now false. So it will be able to break out of the while loop and enter the critical section, okay? So therefore, this solution here allows a process to enter the critical section only once and is not allowing the same process to enter the critical section again if there is another process would like to enter the critical section, okay? If there is no other process, of course, I can go and again enter the critical section. I can do that as much as I want, as long as there are no other processes. But if there is at least one process, then after I uh, leave the critical section, I cannot go ahead and execute the critical section unless the other process or processes has executed their critical section at least once, okay? So therefore, this satisfies the bounded waiting problem. Is it clear? Any questions here? So I can use now, I can code my entry section and exit, exit section in this manner using test and set machine instruction, okay? And have a solution now, critical section problem solution, so that at the end, only one process is guaranteed to be in the critical section, plus I am guaranteed to have bounded waiting, okay? So it's a better solution. And still, it is using test and set hardware instructions. Of course, I have to code that part and that part in assembly, okay? Especially that part because I am using this machine instru instruction directly, okay? So, for example, this can be implemented in a library routine called entry section, and this can be implemented in another library routine called exit section. So the library implementer is worried about how to program in assembly and so on. As a process implementer, program implementer, application programmer, I just use those library routines to protect my critical section. Is it clear? Even I do that, there is one thing that is not very desirable about that solution. What's that? One problem with that solution. So that you don't want to use that all the time. So if there is another solution, you will use that. We can have a better solution than this. What's the problem with this solution? Hmm? Yes, it is busy waiting, right? So it's guaranteeing mutual exclusion, but the process is here looping around. Whenever, for example, there is somebody in the critical region and I am given the CPU and I would like to enter the critical region. During this time, I am not using a, when I am in the CPU, I am not using any use of work, but just looping around, consuming my time slice or time quantum just to loop around, okay? Actually, this should not happen, ideally. If there is in the critical section, 
If, and if I am, I want to be in the critical section, I should not be given the CPU as long as the other process is in the critical sec section. Until the other process leaves the critical section, I should not be given the CPU. I should be maybe waiting, okay, the other process to leave the critical section. Then I can be given the CPU execute, okay? So I need a solution that is enabling or doing this. But this solution is not doing that. Even though I will not be able to go into critical section, with that solution, I will be scheduled to use the CPU and consume the CPU cycles with no useful work, okay? This should not happen. A solution, another solution, that is actually putting me into blocking mode until the other process leaves the critical section. Such a solution would be better because in this case I am not uselessly using the CPU. Somebody else can use the CPU and do some useful work, okay? So this is the problem. So we need better solutions than this. Any questions? Okay. So now the better solution is the semaphores. So now we will see a solution that is actually not causing a process busy wait if that process cannot enter the critical section, but actually enforcing that process to sleep as long as it cannot enter the critical section. So when another process leaves the critical section, then that process is waking up and can be possibly entering the critical section, okay? So this is such a solution. Semaphores enable that, okay? So therefore, they are more efficient to use, okay? So the CPU cycles are not wasted if you use that solution. So semaphore is a synchronization tool mechanism primitive that does not require busy waiting, okay? What's a semaphore? Actually, you can think of it as a variable, integer variable, okay? A kernel variable that can be shared by many processes and act on that. And since it is considered as a kernel variable or a variable implemented as a shared variable, okay, it is accessed via two standard operations, wait and signal, okay? So it's an integer variable that you cannot directly go and modify that. An integer variable, an ordinary variable can be directly modified, right? You can assign something to that, increment, decrement, etc. But you cannot do it with the semaphores. You can just initialize it to some value Again, we are maybe using a special definition that the language provides, or maybe by using a system call. And then you cannot directly go and modify the value of the integer, but you can just operate on that using two standard functions that are called wait and signal, okay? So if you want to modify the value of the semaphore or operate on the semaphore integer, you just, the only thing that you can do is either call wait or signal, okay? So, for example, these wait and signal operations on a small can be implemented as system calls, okay? So, two standard operations, wait and signal, are supported, uh, can be used by the applications to operate on a semaphore. These operations are also called P and V, or down and up, okay? In some other books, they may be referred as down or up, or P and V, or wait and signal, okay? So, there are uh, some people refer to these operations as down and up. Okay, so if you now implement your synchronization solution to your application using semaphores, then you actually have less complicated entry and exit sections, as we will see, okay? And these semaphores, a semaphore can only be accessed via two indivisible atomic operations, as I said, wait and signal. These can be system calls. So they can be implemented actually in kernel, and the kernel makes sure that, the kernel will make sure that they are atomic, these functions, these system calls will be uh, implemented in an atomic manner, and they operate on the semaphore, okay? So as an application programmer, you just call those operations, okay? They are implemented inside the kernel, and they are system calls, okay? Now let's look to the semantics of that, okay? So we will look to the semantics of the, these operations. So a semaphore is an integer variable that can be accessed via two operations, wait or signal. And those operations will be doing that. Okay, we will describe what they are doing after the break, okay? So let's have 10 minutes break. <laughs>